Welcome to Leveraging Leadership, where we unpack the art of business leadership. I'm your host, Emily Sander, Chief of Staff turned Executive Leadership Coach. And this is a show where we find our points of greatest influence and leverage them to better serve those around us. And today's guest is Katrine, and she is currently a Chief of Staff. But Katrine, you started at Oracle, and you were there for about 20 years, and you made your way to Chief of Staff. So I want to hear all about that. But welcome, welcome to the show, and thank you for being on Leveraging Leadership. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Emily. So you started in, I think it was Oracle when, when it was smaller, mm -hmm. but you saw it grow over time. And I believe you started in Oracle Norway and then moved to the U.S. Is that right? Yeah, I started in Oracle consult Consulting for okay. Nordic countries, um, doing ERP implementations. Okay. And then I uh, had opportunity to actually uh, get a job at the Research and Development Center uh, at Oracle HQ. And uh, then, you know, it sort of uh, continued from there where I had different uh, jobs and roles. But um, all in all, you know, you know, coming in as a functional person in an engineering world, uh, it was a little bit rare in the beginning and people didn't even know kind of what I did or how I could contribute, but they, kn they knew that they needed it, <laughs> whatever that it was. So it gave me an opportunity, you know, to really um, start off as a product manager, uh, implemented um, daily business intelligence, which is, you know, K KPIs for leadership at that time. It was implemented into the application. So that was uh Pretty fantastic. I thought, you know, as uh, one thing, you know, to have has have us a good deliverable. And from there, I uh, had opportunity, you know, to move into other roles to do more rollout for, um, I would say, rollout for application and also see uh, Oracle's e business suite uh, transition into what was called Fusion, which is really cloud. Uh, and that was a, just a big, big change, you know, and it was uh, fantastic to be part of that change and working with, you know, uh, all the functions globally to make sure that everyone's ready for the new, um, the new type of um, software, you know, which is very different from on-premise for customers, for partners, for consultants, sales, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, uh, support. So that was that was fantastic, and uh, the last bit of piece I was able to do to you know or had opportunity was to set up a customer community uh, for Oracle. So I've been doing a lot of different things at Oracle, and uh, it certainly gave me a lot of insight into uh, different people, different groups, um, different tools I needed, and how you actually make people you know work with you. And, because they never did work for me. So it was all very virtual and matrix management for me through those, those 20 years. Well, I think you mentioned quite a lot of chief of staff elements in there. So when mm -hmm. I hear they, they knew they needed me, but they weren't quite sure how, I'd, how I would contribute. I was like, oh, that's a great runway to chief of staff and certainly, and certainly leading through influence, maybe not okay. by direct authority as a hallmark of a chief of staff as well. Just curious. So, so you not only moved cities and and branches of the company, but you moved countries. So, I'm just curious, was that um, a big change? Was wh how did you find kind of kind of business in Norway versus business in the U.S.? Yeah, it's certainly certainly a big change. Plus, uh, moving with my very small family at that time and a little daughter of three months. So it was the it was a definitely a big change. You know, you're kind of starting over. You don't have um, a credit rating, even you know, when it oh, comes yes. to new country. So you can't you can't get a bank account and so on and so on, right? So it's it's you're really starting over and with no network really, right? So you have to figure these things out. But it was very exciting. Um, it was, I think it was like a really great, great opportunity. It's something I always aspired to do, to go abroad and work abroad. So when the chance uh, came, you know, me and my husband, we, we took it and never really looked back, right? Even though we traveled back and forth to Norway all the time because there is family and friends. So I think right now we're living the best life, you know, you can get having that opportunity now. And we both have dual citizenship and it's, um, it's pretty 
fantastic for, for both of us and our children as well. Grown adult children, I should say now. <laughs> and how big was Oracle when you when you first started? Because that's, that's you know, 20 year span. That's got to be quite a change. Yeah, I don't know for sure, but well, well below 100,000 employees, you know, so I would say it was like, and now I think it's like 120 to 140,000. I'm not entirely sure, um, but it was way, way smaller. So I just really saw how, you know, everything changed and shaped, you know, how consulting changed dramatically, how the support system changed dramatically. And it's really what happens, you know, as you go through a transformation. Uh, that it is to go from an on-prem to a cloud-based business, which is, I think everyone, most everyone is in cloud now, you know, at least if you're new, you start as cloud. But of course, uh, the bigger companies are still have on-prem customers that are hesitant to move to cloud, right? So you still have a little bit of that happening. Right. So again, but, adaptability, you you adapted yeah. over the 20 years for sure. Yeah. And then you, you worked at one other company before becoming chief of staff. So maybe give us a brief summary of, of Oracle and then leading into becoming chief of staff. Yeah, I were uh, I transitioned into a data center company called Equinix. Uh, I was hired to stand up um, an operations um, group, you know, to make sure that the product division of Equinix, which is a different uh, place than um, the data center business. Uh, so I wanted to grow the product area into another revenue stream. And that was initiated, but then again, it was a little bit from what I know, uh, chaotic or ill-defined processes and systems and disciplines. So that was what I was hired to come in to do. Uh, so, you know, we grew that uh, based on the needs of the product managers, the designers, and the engineers and leadership into creating uh, a lot more governance and cadence for how we go to market with products, how we align with the other uh, lines of businesses, such as sales, marketing, um, customer service, customer experience, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, through that process, we set up um, uh, customer documentation, customer learning, communication internally and externally. Uh, we set up an agile team with Scrum leads, Scrum masters. Uh, we set up, um, let's see, uh, we did, yeah, of course, a PMO office. So we hardened that. Uh, we had uh, a lot more processes and tools to standardize on a lot of things, you know, for how you get ideas, how you create product roadmaps, how you work with um, FPNA for uh, financial and operations data, run uh, QBRs, set up OKRs and KPIs, <laughs> and vision, roadmap, you know, all of those things, right? So, so whether um, you liked it or not, or whether you knew it or not, you were being prepared to be a chief yeah. of staff. <laughs> yes. So, you know, we, uh, from a people standpoint, you know, we grew that team from about uh, 12, 10, 12 people to 60, probably. And we had like um, eight to 10 groups, you know, of different uh, uh, things that we were doing, those that I already mentioned. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was really a lot of context switching uh, for me as we were doing this, you know, every hour it was something different to deal with, you know, whether it was internally or it was externally or with other groups, but it was really an, an incredible experience. And I, I loved, loved it. You know, I think we made a, a big, big change, you know, for how, we, how you uh, got product on the map, right. For the customers and within Equinix as well. So how did you become a chief of staff? <laughs> yeah, that was, uh... That wasn't anything I actually had thought about, actually, but um, uh, a, a former manager of mine, she uh, uh, heard about this role through, you know, her network and uh, connected me with um, uh, that company. And uh, it was uh, quite interesting because this was, uh, again, uh, something that I've been aspiring to do to go into a smaller company, but I hadn't done it yet, you know, because Ethnix 2 was was a big company, you know, uh, like was uh, about, I think, 12,000 employees when I started and it's bigger now. 
Uh, but then this company had, you know, 140 people in it and um, different uh, technologies in fiber business. So that was, again, something new for me to to learn about and get into the details about, you know, and really the, the chief of staff role came about uh, that the, the board had been wanting um, the CEO to look for a chief of staff. Um, the, the chief, um, uh, um, the chief executive officer was fairly new as well. He had joined six months before me. So when we talked and I talked to him and two board representatives as well, it really was a good, really good fit. And I, I'm super excited to learn about this, you know, and have that uh, opportunity to, to get to work with a board and a private equity firm and with a smaller company. So that's really how that started. And um, it, I wasn't really sure exactly what this role was. We, we talked about it, you know, but so then coming in, I ended up writing my own 30, 60, 90 day goals and um, started working um, uh, really closely with the CEO from day one. And for the 12 month tenure I had there, we worked together every day, you know, so I would say one of the good, really good things here, you know, and I think this is really important for chapel staffs is that you have access to your manager. If you do not have that, I think it's going to be virtually impossible to have a success as a chief of staff. So I had that because he needed it and they had suffered a little bit without a chief of staff. So. So interesting that the board recognized we brought on this new CEO mm -hmm. and we think that a chief of staff would really help him and the team. So um, that's interesting. You're at least the second guest who has said, I became chief of staff at a board recommendation. So that's, um, that's fantastic. And then what was your level of interaction with the board ongoing? Did you continue to stay in touch with them? Was it board meetings or was that mostly through the CEO? How did that work? Yeah, no, I became a uh, part of the, the board meetings from really day one, right? So I uh, was the one that uh, decided to get with the CEO the agenda uh, for the board meetings. So we set up a new cadence for that with input from the board members because we had really close contact with them. So we were like, uh, okay, so this is what we're thinking of the agenda. What do you think? <laughs> so we had three board committees prior to the board meeting. So we were really active in making sure that we had the right topics from our point of view and then checking in with them to see if there's anything that overlooked or any other trends that they wanted to get into the, into the board committee meetings and the board meeting. So that's how we interacted with them. And also there were a couple of those uh, board committees that we had uh, additional meetings um, and touch points on just because uh, there were, you know, things we, we needed to uh, figure out sooner than later. Uh, it's, you know, it's timely that you need to kind of make decisions and uh, and prioritize the right thing. So that's how I worked quite closely with a couple of them uh, through the whole uh, 12 months. And we were able, you know, to get a lot of things sorted out uh, quickly. And I think that a good influence, you know, on how well the board meetings uh, went as well. So yeah, I really um, worked really closely with both the board as well as leadership in the company and the managers underneath as well. It sounds like it sounds like you were a bit of a, a conduit or kind of a translator between the different parties and making sure everyone was coordinated on what was being presented and if that was going to resonate or is the most relevant thing yeah. to to your stakeholders. And yeah. then I'm just curious, was there a was there a change um going from, you know, Oracle and the other company you worked at to a private equity backed board? Because I have a lot of clients who are like, "Oh my gosh, I was at this traditional company and now I'm at a PE firm um and I've been there and it's 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 a different it's a different ball game so to yeah. speak." So, what was your impression of that? Yeah, no, it, it certainly is. Um, you know, you have to create return on investment, right? That is a big 
part of why a PE invests in, uh, in the company, right? So uh, the financial aspect is huge. Um, but I would say that this PE company was really amazing. They were really focused on a couple of other things, you know, they, they really believe in people as the number one thing. Uh, then there is tools, the right tools. You have to right size it to the company. And, and then it's the, um, it's the processes. So it's really, it was like music to my ears because <laughs> I hundred percent know that those things are so important. Um, so that just fit really well with my mindset as well, or my experience, I should say, you know, cause through 20 plus years, so working in Silicon Valley uh, and so on, right. You, you learn a thing or two, right. You see what works, you see what doesn't work. So coming into a smaller company with a PE back, which is PE backed, and they're saying these things, I'm like, this is great. This is. I shouldn't be surprised, but I was a little bit, you know, but I was delightfully surprised, right? And um, and they stayed true to that, you know? So yes, they wanted their uh, investments, you know, sure. to be profitable, right? But at the same time, getting the right people in the right seats, you know, they totally understood that, you know? And looking at the technology and processes are important too, right? Because you have to make sure that uh, everyone knows what they're doing and how to do it, right? So that was really very nice. Uh, and then how they actually worked so closely with um, me, for instance, and a couple of other people in the finance side that wasn't officially a part of the board, right? Because the CEO was officially part of the board, but they were all in the board as well, a couple of us, right? And I was in all the board meetings. And, and so you feel very included and it gives you a very uh, quick introduction to uh, how a private equity company works <laughs> um, and and their other uh, companies that they had uh, invested in as part of their portfolio. So you got to meet some of them and I cross-trained another um, COO uh, into a chief of staff role because they wanted that. So, you know, they leveraged a little bit of the different skill sets across their portfolio companies. So I thought that was also pretty impressive how they actually realized what they had and how they could, um, you know, expand that type of uh, skill set to other portfolio companies that didn't have it at that time. Interesting. Yes. Okay. So they put it across all their portfolio companies. Mm -hmm. Very, very cool. You work closely with the COO. We, so you, you work closely with your CEO, of course, yep. but also I wanted to touch on the COO relationship mm -hmm. because sometimes people get that um, you know, there's, there's sometimes some friction between the chief of staff and the chief operating officer. And I wanted to just touch on your, on your version of that. Cause it seemed like you, you two worked very closely and very collaboratively together. Yeah. And, uh, and a big part of that, I think for, uh, for all of us was that, um, the CEO, the COO and my self, you know, as chief of staff, we were in the office every other week together. And which means, you know, there was a lot of uh, water cooler conversations, quick meetings, those kind of things. And of course we met uh, on the off week as well. It's not that we didn't, but I think it just um, accelerated the relationships really quickly and the trust. Uh, and that way, you know, I was able to work um, uh, more in the details a little bit, you know, with the CLO. He was really interested in, you know, could you help the group with uh, how they could um, set up a better product roadmap process, you know, how I could run my meetings, how I could, you know, accelerate the issues list and how to prioritize it and, you know, how to really help with uh, what are the processes we should go after and how to really simplify some of the processes because he felt like it was, was, you know, just complex for such a small company, right? Um, so that's how I was able to, you know, to get in with his IT folks, you know, and um, um, the fiber groups that were, you know, out in the field. And so, you know, we worked a little bit closely with the different managers uh, for their different areas. And um, so there was different things um, every week, kind of, you know, that we were, were looking at. And then we tried to just, you know, uh, figure it out, 
make a plan, set some goals, and then go and, you know, execute to that, right? Not so everything was executed well, but you know, yeah. <laughs> if you don't do anything, of course, nothing will happen, right? So there were certain projects we had to abandon because we had other priorities, but at least we knew we abandoned them, right? It was yeah. um, a decision. Well, that's interesting because that's an important decision though, right? So yeah. what you what you say no to is sometimes as important or or more so than what you say yes to. So maybe that's an interesting interesting one. Can you talk a little bit more about how maybe you, your COO and your CEO decided those things? Maybe in the other, other every other week meetings, how would you say, you know what, we have to sacrifice this one or delay it and, and not take it on right now for other things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we did. And um, um, the way that we ended up doing that, you know, was that we established, you know, a very simple Excel sheet which had where we started and uh, putting all all the issues and projects and tasks you know of some size right and we uh, we um discussed you know with the the other managers too you know well what are you working on you know that is not just your typical around the business tasks right but are other exceptional things that are a problem right so we got it on the list uh, I worked with also the the senior leaders, which is a level down from the C-suite. Uh, they were a group of about 10 people and we really combed through that list, you know, and then I brought that back up to C-suite and to the CEO and the COO. And we decided on, okay, we're going to do this, 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 but we're going to hold on these, right? Mm -hmm. So they didn't disappear. So now they were in a repository, which is a spreadsheet, right? And uh, and then people had access to it and there were names on it and we put dates to it. And we really went through that every week in these two, two meetings, the manager meetings, as well as the um, COO, CEO um, meeting. And that way we were able to cancel or put things on hold. But I'll tell you that's so, so difficult to do. We weren't successful at, at all of that because it's like, you know, like a kid in the candy store, you want to do everything, right? <laughs> it's hard to say no, but that's how that's how you're able to say yes and do it well. Yeah. yeah. Like that. It, it sounds like if you were having that meeting every week, people uh -huh. were very in tune with, okay, we're, we're setting that aside now. We've decided to do that. And people yeah. weren't flailing over here trying to get something done when, oh, we're not doing that anymore type of thing. So yeah. you were, you were, in the middle of of the 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 translation to maybe the product folks where hey we're putting a hold on this and then the decision with the ceo and coo around hey here are all the things on on the menu yeah. which ones do we want to pick off this quarter or this year no exactly and that's how we actually did do that we had uh, quarterly goals we call them uh, okrs objectives key results but they're you know quarterly and in, in duration right um, and we chose uh, the uh, the top, I think we ended up with top 12. Uh, so we each had like two to two to three uh, OKRs that we owned at the C-suite level, just as an executive sponsor, right? And then those were the ones that we were pushing through each quarter. So that could be around uh, finance, uh, marketing sales, uh, operations and strategic. I think those were the buckets that we that we had set up, and then we we had a really like as a nice visual as well, a PowerPoint that you can see them. We used that in all hands uh, and communication with the rest of the employees, so they were aware. Oh, these are the top ones. It doesn't mean you sh shouldn't do your you know uh, <laughs> regular bis run the business tasks, right? Or other KPIs that are on your plate, right? But then again, these are the ones that are top priorities right now because they align with the vision and the strategy and where we're going. And that was also how we reported in to the board because uh, aside from the quarterly meetings, we also had monthly uh, check-ins with a subset of the board where we were running through this uh, view of, say, the 12 OKRs. If we're on track, off track, if we're off track, what are we doing about it? Uh, and uh, there's something actually dropping off because it's not a priority that happened to right? But it, there was a very transparency and clarity. Um, and it was 
easy for everyone to know what's going on, what's the focus. Uh, and also like at some point, you know, we also said we're not doing X, Y, and C. So there's very clarity that if you're working on that, tell your manager because you shouldn't spend an hour on it right now. Right. It was, it was clear that we're stopping that now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was, it sounds like you were using the same mechanism from the board level all the way through the C-suite to your senior managers to kind of mid-level managers and on. So everyone was kind of working off of the same OKR system or the, the same kind of cadence. So I think that lends itself really well to being clear and clarity equals success. Yeah. So yeah. You know, as a chief of staff, I think we have to do that in kind of whatever form or whatever mechanism makes sense for the team and company at that stage. But it sounds like you were, you were pretty involved in making sure that was happening at all levels. Yeah, we, uh, we, sh we sure did. And uh, I think it was refreshing for many of the employees and leaders as well that, that we had this in place because it creates a little bit of security as well, knowing uh, what's uh, prioritized, what we're working on. Um, and of course, you know, it's, it doesn't always play out the way you hope, right? But the thing is, you know, having a plan is better than not having a plan, right? And then you can at least um, redirect or uh, think differently or make that decision, right? To continue or not, right? You have a plan so you can change the plan. Yeah. Um, but, but I think that people, I mean, people don't like to be throttled throttled as in I'm being task switched over here, I'm switching over here, oh, we're starting and stopping. I think they're okay with that if they're clear about, here's how I know that, or here's how I'm informed of what I should be working on. They don't. Might, they might not love it still, but all things being equal, I can handle the change if it's clearly communicated to me. And I know, okay, at this weekly meeting, no. you know, Katrina is going to say, yes, you're still working on the highest priority thing, continue yeah. working on that, or, hey, we've made a decision and we're actually going to prioritize this product launch. And so please, please put your resources over here. Yeah. So that That's is actually, uh, another thing that I, I learned throughout my career, but it became really evident to me uh, in my chief of staff role that you have to be really clear and articulated well, uh, the why and the what, to the employees, like, what are we doing and why are we doing it? Because <laughs> yeah. often it's, and I, I do remember this very well from uh, back day, the days at Oracle with engineers, you know, they're very, very eager to do it. So they, they're jumping into the how, you know, oh, we can solve it this way or that way, right? And I, I, I think I just sort of, that sort of became just a part of my learning, you know, but I hadn't actually put any words on it until I actually came into the chief of staff role and they lived more reading about different things. And I was just like, oh my goodness, this is what it is. You have to really define the what and the why and articulate it and share it. And when that's understood, then people can figure out the how and they can do that. I love that. And I think you don't want people, I mean, sometimes it, there's scenarios where it's like, go do these three steps and please yeah. do them now. But most of the time it's providing people context, the why, so that they can make better decisions on the how, because yeah. they're closer to the to it yeah. than you are. They have the technical expertise that you might not. And so yeah. if you give them the context and why we're doing something and maybe what we're trying to accomplish, they can come up with the best how. So I think that's, yeah. that's a great point. Um, as we down here, what book recommendations would you have for people? Uh, there's one in particular, I, I think that stands out to me that really puts, pulls a lot of this into context. And that's the book is called Traction by Gina Wickman. Um, it's, I read it many, many times. Um, uh, and we started also to implement that system at, um, the company I was the chief of staff for, and it was was a really good system. Uh, it's really good for mid-sized uh, companies or you know departments in bigger companies, uh, and it goes through a system for how you actually keep track of all everything you know from what data are important, you know which tools do you use, what's the processes, how do you pick the right people, how do you you know 
incentivize them or how do you uh, get them inspired? Those kind of things, right? So um, that is, that's an um, incredible practical book, I would say. It's not that theoretical because it's all based on, um, I, I think it's like hundreds and hundreds of um, examples of how companies have actually gone about implementing uh, and going, you know, uh, starting from their vision, their strategy, and how to actually go and execute. So you will achieve traction at some point, right? Uh, it's natural to hit some glass ceilings. It's natural to, you know, or the plateau, right? Um, but then how do you move forward? You know, how do you actually are able to grow your revenue? How do you do that, you know? Uh, so this hits on a lot of that. So that's definitely the, that one book, you know, that um, I think it's a, it's something you need to read, you know, if you're interested in these types of practical elements and tools in it because it it has it's filled with that. And um, I think it will be a, um, an eye-opener to a lot of people, you know, and you can use it. You don't even say you need, you don't even have to tell people you're using traction, you know, you can go, <laughs> oh, we're going, let's do this met methodology, you know, or let's check this out, right? It's, um, it's really good. So you just start incorporating elements of traction into, into your workflow and into your meetings. Yes. That's yeah, sometimes you can do the best that. way to do it. You don't need to announce it all the time. Just, you don't have just to. Start doing or, it. or you can go and find an uh, implementer, right? Who can work with you to do, to really implement it. Right. Which we actually did. Uh, and that is also, you know, how, um, it was very interesting to me too, you know, how the chief of staff, yeah. um, work so closely with them, the CEO, and then the CEO is usually um, pitched as the visionary and the chief of staff or head of ops is the integrator. And that's right. how the integrator works really, really closely across the other C-suite people. So you work with CFO, the CFO, the CMO or, or, or chief sales officer, or if there's others as well, right? and works further down as well. But, you know, it's the integrator that really does a lot of the the day-to-day the -day and really translates the strategy into the operational piece. How do you operationalize the strategy? And, and, the, and you know, the communication, right, sits a lot with the, with the integrator as well. And it sounds open like people's staff. <laughs> yes, it sounds like a very tactical and practical book, which which yeah. are uh, one of my favorites. And so that's a great book recommendation. And um, thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing all of your insights from your run up to being chief of staff and then your time in that role. Absolutely. They really appreciate it. So thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Emily. If you'd like some more information on the topic discussed in this episode, head over to nextlevel.coach and click on the resources page for some helpful free downloads.